Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, I'm very sorry that I won't address you in Russian, but uh, <laughs> I'm really honored uh, to be here in St. Petersburg at the Netherlands Institute to deliver this lecture. A lecture that, in a sense, has a topical relevance with regard to the history of this very city since the release of uh, the documentary 900 Days made by the Dutch director Jessica Korte, and I will return to the film at the end of this lecture. This uh, afternoon I would like to present an overview of the patterns in memory culture in Eastern as well as Western Europe from 1945 <coughs> to till the turn of the century. And I will focus mainly on the visual arts, particularly monuments, and also briefly to film. Giving an, an, an overview, I have to stress that I will mainly deal with dominant patterns in memory culture. Memory culture is, by its nature, layered and complex, and I am well aware of the fact that in each country, at every moment in history, there are me other memories as well individual and social memories within families and other communities, memories that are absent or even silent in the public sphere, memories that may even be completely contrary to the dominant patterns, as I will point out now and then in my lecture. My lecture, ladies and gentlemen, falls apart in two sections. Part one is devoted to the memory of World War II in the first decades after 1945, in the East and the West. And part two will deal with the often dramatic changes that took place from the late 1960s on until the present, but in different countries at different points in history, as I will show. My main argument this afternoon is that the changes in memory culture in the second period may be traced back to the critical thinking in the years right after 1945. May, uh, uh, particularly artists and intellectuals were puzzled by the question whether our language, our artistic forms, would ever meet the experience of extreme barbarism of the recent past, to start only with the Nazi annihilation camps. This, of course, is the meaning of the famous words of Theodor Adorno, that I quote, Writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. You see it in German. As early as the first years after the Second World War, quite a number of filmmakers, writers, and artists appeared to believe, like Adorno, that traditional aesthetic forms did fail to meet the vivid need to commemorate recent experiences. Would it be possible, the famous British sculptor Henry Moore, who had an international jury that was to select to design a design for an international memorial in Auschwitz Birkenau in 1957, would it be possible, so he wondered, to create a work of art on an appropriate scale in relation to the proportions of the crime and the ugliness, murder and horror, that uh, could express the emotions engendered by Auschwitz? A pressing question, indeed. But the artists and philosophers who raised it were hardly heard in this years, since the dominant memory culture left very little room for dissenting views and alternative aesthetic forms, as most of the monuments, novels, films, and commemorative rituals in various countries demonstrate. During the first decade after World War II, public memory followed traditional nationalist political and religious patterns everywhere in Europe. Private memories that were no, not in line with the idea of national unity or the dominant ideology were not heard or even repressed. This tendency became even stronger as international tensions increased during the Cold War. To see what I mean with the proposition that public memory followed traditional patterns, it may be useful to have a look at the monuments that were erected, or to the commemorative practices in various countries that had been occupied, such as the Netherlands, France, 
Poland and the Soviet Union. Let's start with some slides of monuments, monuments commemorating the Great Fatherland War in the Soviet Union. The monuments clearly rep represented the idea of the war against Germany as an heroic struggle of the socialist fatherland against a system that was considered to be the result of the convulsions of capitalism, as fascism and Nazism were characterized according to Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy. Hero and hero were worship, not only of the leading general marshal Zukov, but also the ordinary soldiers at Stalingrad. No, this is the, the, the left and the right. Uh, but also, uh, as I said, the, uh, the struggling nation symbolized by the immense statue of Mother Russia. All examples of the dominant nationalist, national communist culture of heroism using the classical aesthetic language that dominated European monumental tradition for long. It was even applied to the monument that was erected to commemorate the mass killings of the Jews of Kiev in the fields of Babiyar. Even this monument comes close to the idea of heroic struggle. Precisely these patterns of public commemoration were to be found everywhere in Eastern Europe to show you just some other examples, like the Victory Monument in Russia, or the Monument for the Red Army in the same city, or the monument, the famous Ghetto Uprising Monument by Rappaport, this one being the most remarkable. It is a monument in commemoration of the uprising of the ghetto, not its elimination. The Warsaw Ghetto Monument may be considered as exemplary for the commemoration culture in Eastern Europe, considering its complex and layered character and political nature. As being said, Nathan Rappaport's monument commemorating the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto was erected, erected as early as 1948, made out of the stones which, ironically, had already been cut for Arnold Baker, Hitler's favorite sculpture who was to use it for what he saw the final victory monument in Berlin. Rappaport's monument was a clear expression of the dominant socialist communist commemorative culture, stressing martyrdom and solidarity against the class-based Nazi terror. To understand this interpretation, one should realize that public memory in Poland from 1945 till the early 70s was dominated by competing discourses. On the one hand, the views propagated by the radical left and, from 1948 on, the communist government. The communist government. And on the other hand, the attitudes and opinions of the non-communist majority of the Polish population. According to the official interpretation, the Jews of Poland had been victims, as I said before, of the convulsions of capitalism, according to orthodox Marxist theory, while the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 was regarded as a revolt against a decadent social order, an heroic episode in the history of class struggle in Poland, in commemoration of which the impressive monument of Rappaport was erected immediately after the war. The same interpretation underlined the monumentalization of former camps, such, such as auschwitz birkenau as well as some fiction films on camps like The Last Stage, made as early as 1946 and staged on location in the camp, being Auschwitz itself, and some barracks of the camp were rebuilt and 200 former prisoners got a role in the film, a fact that seems incredible nowadays. Behind this official memory culture, however, other stories and interpretations survived in Poland. Let's stick to our example of Poland. The majority of non-communist and non-Jewish Poles did not like the way the devastating war years were commemorated by the government. Instead, they cherished the memory of another uprising, the nationalist uprising of the capital in 1944, 
involved in ended in bloodshed as well. The Germans killing more than 200,000 people and ruining the city, an historical event that was ignored by the communist regime. Consequently, many Poles viewed officially promoted commemoration of the ghetto uprising as what they saw a Jewish communist affair, <coughs> being part of a complot against the real Poland. These nationalists, mostly Catholic Poles, simply denied the Nazi persecution of the Jews, an attitude that even led to an openly expressed strong anti-Semitism. These sentiments made it possible that during the first years, 47, 48, after the war, a few hundred of Jews were killed in anti-Semitic riots after the Second World War. Socialism and communism were made out to be a Jewish movement. The international protests against these anti-Semitic outbursts were depicted as the result of anti-Polish agitation by the international jury, as if the war never happened. One may say a sad conclusion. Three million Jewish fellow countrymen could not prevent the revival of traditional dark stories of ritual child murders. Poles, Poles who had given support to their fellow countrymen, countrymen during the Nazi period did not dare to mention this openly during many years. When we turn from the east to the west, we might see commemorative patterns that are more or less comparable to these of the east. Let's first look to prevailing commemoration culture in the country where I come from, the Netherlands. The dominant mode of commemorating this, the German occupation of the Netherlands may be qualified as nationalist and Christian humanist, representing the Netherlands as an innocent and peaceful nation which became the victim of German aggression. This message was repeated over and over again. From the very beginning in 1945, as becomes clear from the commemoration practices, mainly honoring those who had fallen in the struggle against the occupier. Resistance fighters, soldiers, sailors, civilians and hostages were being shot. This tendency is being mirrored in films and novels, but above all in about 1500 monuments that were erected in the Netherlands throughout the country during the first 15 years after 1945. 1500, quite remarkable for a country with a very weak tradition in public sculpture. <coughs> These early monuments, I've just shown some of them, express the idea of continuity and restoration, relating the war experience to the present and to the future. The main theme of this period may be found in the intersection of grief and consolation, of losing and gaining, of past and future, expressed in the central thought of sacrifice, a suffering that not had been in vain. That's the, one of the main topics of these monuments. These ideas may be found in war movies, speeches, newspaper articles, and works of literature during these first 20 years in the Netherlands. The principal idea that the suffering had not been in vain implies that the memories of the war had to be integrated into a prevailing political and ideological framework, into a discourse, the fundamental of which in the Netherlands was, as I said, nationalist and Christian humanist. Just to give you an example from this slide, uh, left below, it's over there, uh, uh, you see a, a relief, a white pigeon flying up from opened hands in the midst of water clearly referring to the biblical story of Noah, seeing whether there is life after the flood. So this is one of the Christian themes that comes back over and over again in these monuments. And all these characteristics return in an extraordinary monument. A monument, the liberation window, a huge eight meters high stained window in the old cathedral of the city of Gouda, in the heartland of Holland. 
The place of this liberation window, as it is called, is a statement in itself. The Cathedral of St. John contains dozens of very old, four century old stained windows, dating back to the early 16th and 17th century, referring in many ways to the birth of the country, of the Netherlands itself. In this national historical environment, this liberation window was constructed two years after the war. Now let's have a brief look to the window and notice the, the central part of it. This is the central part. In the center, we see the liberated Dutch people under a banner, a scene that clearly refers to, as you might see, the resemblance to the Rembrandt's Night, night Watch. Uh, as well as to the famous 1830 painting of David and Mariana leading the people to freedom. Back, you see the dog, for example, you see how the light is uh, organized in this picture, so it has reference to these two paintings. At the top of the, of the window, we see the man on horseback, taken from the apocalypse frightening the white birds and bringing plagues, the disasters of the war over the Netherlands, the floods, the bombings, the shootings. Interesting are the two side windows that illuminate the fate of individuals and specific groups in society. The first one, this one is showing razzias of people, mass evacuations, 10,000 of people had to leave home for military purposes, and the deportation of Jewish family below. The other window, left window, showing bombings, the arresting of political prisoners, and concentration camps. Furthermore, the window contains the symbols of the provinces down there, below, uh, and the royal house, and the main line taken from Exodus, from the Bible. And Tao has led the people to freedom. And these people, not the Jewish people, but the Dutch people, of course. I consider the Gouda liberation window as a perfect illustration of the way Dutch society wanted to remember these five years of occupation, representing the Netherlands, as I said, as an innocent and peaceful nation which became the victim of German aggression. According to this view, the Netherlands was not equal to the superior military power of Germany, but inward, mentally, the Dutch people did not yield. To put it simply, the Dutch may not have been heroes, like the, like the Russians, but as a honest, honest people, they did their duties, they sheltered their persecuted fellow countrymen, and they remained loyal to their flag and to their queen. The unity of the nation was manifested precisely in the so-called inward mentality of the population. It opened, it opened the way to leave aside the dubious role of Dutch police force, for example, and the bureaucracy, and to ignore the widespread betrayal and collaboration also in the Netherlands. Closely related to the image of an unyielding national unity was the obvious blindness for the fact that the fate of the Jewish community was very different from that of the Dutch nation. 100,000 Jewish fellow citizens had been murdered, 70% of the total Jewish population of the country, being the highest percentage of all Western Europe. To be sure, within the nationalist perspective, these facts were not kept silent or ignored or fully ignored, but they were almost imperceptibly woven into the national memory, the national collective memory, as becomes clear from the St. John State window. They are chapters from a national history. The stories about the deportations and the mass killings of the Dutch Jews were first and for all part of a national history an illustration of German atrocities and suffering brought upon the Dutch people. How powerful this perspective was appears from also in historical writing from this period. The persecution was considered as not being part 
of Dutch history. It wouldn't be hard to elaborate a comparable line of argument for other countries in Western Europe. Take, for example, the history of memory of France. For decades, the painful history of the widespread collaboration was fully denied. Studying French historical culture of the 50s and 60s, one may easily get the impression that the second French, so called Second French Revolution, led by Pétain in 1940, never took place, and that Vichy, the collaborative government in southern France, never existed. In the dominant historical culture, there were no traces at all of the sharp conflicts that rooted in the 19th century struggle between Republicans and anti-Republicans anti and almost led to civil war during the German occupation. This, I would say, false image of national unity against Germany was created already at the end of the war. Charles de Gaulle, leader of the French, French army in exile, set the tune in a speech on the occasion of the liberation of Paris on August 24, 25, 1944, in the Hotel de Ville. I do the French, just one sentence. La France tout entière, de la France qui se bat, de la, de la seule France, de la vraie France, de la France éternelle. France, complete, tortured, true, eternal, had freed itself. The myth of la résistance was born here. The myth was going to be cultivated by all means uh, throughout the next decades. Meant to contribute it to the reconstruction, reconstruction of a deeply torn nation. At the same time, the meaning of Vichy was minimalized as far as possible, while this regime had been responsible for many crimes, like, for example, the arrest of 135,000 people. 60,000 of them were sent to French camps, the persecution of 60,000 Freemasons, pressing 650,000 civilians to join the labor force in Germany, participating actively in the persecution of freedom fighters, and last but not least, the deportation of 76,000 Jews, only 3% of whom survived the war. That was what Fiji brought to France. These crimes were kept silent about or contributed to a small minority of fanatic collaborators. The goal created in the collective memory an entity that had never existed as such. La Résistance, a, tra a transcendent object of memory, a construction within which several groups, including the communists, received their own place. <coughs> that was the main image of the French memory culture the first 20, I would even say the first 40 years. So far, we have been discussing dominant patterns in this commemoration culture in the East and the West. Images, ideas, practices, a discourse that dominated public memory all over Europe. There were, however, dissenting voices, as I already mentioned, in the beginning of my talk. Dissenting voices breaking away from the ideological, religious and national discourses, highlighting other aspects of the past, giving the past a different, very different, sometimes contrary meaning. Two Polish films both made in 1957, and one French, made one, made one year earlier, might illuminate this argument. The first film I want to refer to, but it's not this one, okay. The first film I want to refer to is a relatively unknown film. The Real End of the Great War, 1957, by Kabalajowicz. This film, based on a script of a Catholic author, Jerzy Zawieski, is not particularly well made, but definitely quite unique for these years. It deals with trauma, with the syndrome of the camp survivor. It tells the story of a former prisoner, a survivor who is haunted by memory, 
who lost his capacity or cap capability to speak, who is not able to laugh or to be laughed, and decides at the end to attempt suicide explains the title, The Real End of the Great War. It's a film on despair on the part of the survivor, but also of his wife, who is not able to reach her husband. The Real End of the Great War deals with bounds that never heal, the concentration camp syndrome, with traumas, a theme that appears elsewhere only in the late 1960s, in documentaries and even later fiction films. And the same goes more or less for André Baida's 1957 film, Canal, which is a portrayal of the tragic heroism and the unprecedented suffering of the member of a unit of Poland's home or underground army during the Warsaw Uprising of August of September 1944. The story opens on the 56th day of the uprising. A resistance moved unit of 43 men and women around whom the story of the film is woven, is forced to give up its position. The German army is too strong. Rather than surrendering, the unit tries to escape by crawling through miles of pitch black stinking sewers, crisscrossing the town below its surface. Death awaits each of them. It's a story of betrayal, suicide, getting mad, being killed, and when two of the underground army members, Kora and Stokotka, finally reach the Suez outlet at the Fistula River, they do so only to find their way barred at the sturdy iron grating. And that's what you see in the back of this picture. So they can't leave. There's no way out. The theme of this film greatly differs from communist public memory before. As we will see later, Canal is made out of Vaida's meditation on heroism, sacrifice, and their place in national identity. Contrary, however, not only to official communist memory in Poland, but also contrary to the non-official nationalist Catholic memories. That brings us to the French counterpart of these films. Nuit et Brouillard, Night and Fort by Alain René, one year older than Vida's masterpiece, dating from 1956. There is a dual meaning behind the title of Alain René documentary, Night and Fog, We Have We Are. The title refers, on the one hand, to the arrival of interned prisoners into the concentration camps under the cloak of darkness, and on the other hand, to the subconscious suppression of knowledge and culpability for the resulting horrors of the committed atrocities. The film opens with images of an idyllic, seemingly impressionistic barn, country, barn countryside. But this is no ordinary, remote, open, that's what you see on the right. This is not, uh, uh, this is not an ordinary, remote, open field. It is 1955, and this is supposed to be Poland, and the site is Auschwitz. Switching be between the stillness of the modern day landscape and the highly unsettling archival footage of the extreme atrocities, for example, recorded during the liberation of the camps by the US and Russian armies, René creates a powerful, haunting chronicle of cruelty, dehumanization, and denial of personal responsibility. It's another planet the concentration, the annihilation camp. It's another planet, the Anus Mundi, a universe, an universe of passionaire, in which words and acts have different, often, often opposite meaning of everyday life. At the same time, Night of Folk is an examination of repressed memory. The film is a forceful indictment of the deliberate obscur obscur obscuration of, the, of truth an oppressive truth with moral and universal repercussion. It poses the issue of moral responsibility as the narrator, Jean Cairol, a concentration camp survivor himself, asks the fundamental question in the film, who is responsible? And that's the question that comes over and over again. 
taking into account the prevailing commemorative culture in the West and the East, as described, we might, we might understand why films like Nuit et Brouillard and Canal and The Real End of the Great War should be considered to be more or less its counterpart, its countermember. They turn away from narratives of heroism and nationalism. They don't stress continuity or the idea that all this suffering, this human toll, really serves a higher cause. Turning away from such tra traditional collectivist, national communist, national Christian, or republican notions, these films open up other themes. Individual suffering, trauma, a past without a closing or a meaningful end, leaving, as Nuria Bouillard does, its audience with indigestible images of an undigested history. These kinds of ideas, which we might call an emerging commemorative subculture or counter discourse, was developed in, in various countries, notably among writers, poets, artists, and philosophers. In France, in France it found its roots among, uh, uh, um, among intellectuals more or less related to the resistance to which René himself belonged. In Poland, the new views were propelled by a cultural movement to which several filmmakers belonged, to mention only André Munch and Wojciech Haas. They formed the Polish School, a group of young artists introducing similar thoughts into a theater, literature, and cinema. From the mid-50s on till the early 60s, favored by the political changes in 1956, leading to Gomułka's rise of power at the beginning of the so-called Polish road to socialism. In this gap, in this ideological gap, they developed a new aesthetic, new aesthetic program. Directors like Wajda, Kablarowicz, Monk and Haas had ample opportunity to apply dissenting interpretations of the past, practicing a so-called strategy of the psychotherapist, as Haas called it, they confronted the audience with the national complexes produced by the social and political tragedies of the recent past. The Polish Spring even led to aesthetic experiments in relation to monumentalizations of the scene of the Nazi crimes, Auschwitz and Treblinka. The first slide shows the design that won the international competition I mentioned before for an Auschwitz monument presided by Henry Moore in 1956-1958, made by the Polish architect and artist Oskar and Sofia Hanse, Jetsi and Jan, Jan Kiewicz and Jan Jan Pak. Their design that was never realized because too many, too many people found it inappropriate consisted out of a tar roadway 1,000 meters long and 70 meters wide, which would run di di diagonally across the camp from the rail line to the crematoriums, where it would abruptly end in the fields and the woods. Every, that everything that still stood along this way, in this line, this tar, tar road, the remains of the barracks, the latrines, the barbed wire, the foundation, and the pieces of walls, the chimneys, would be included and immortalized in this star strip. The designers wanted, as, the, as it were, to fix a portion of the camp for all eternity, as a sort of petrified past, right across the horrors of history, while the surroundings, the rest of the camp, would be left to the ravages of time, to, to slow decay to be over and, and, and be overrun by vegetation. The road monument was to arouse the same sensation as the ruins of Pompeii. Starting from the present, from life, the line of death would be crossed. <coughs> and the second example I want to show you, I can know it, is the monument of Haupt and Lutsenko at Treblinka a monument created between 1956 and 1964, a huge field with three immense concrete fields, studded with stones, 17,000 
altogether, stretch it out for the eyes of the visitors, with an eight, eight meters high obelisk, uh, obelisk of granite blocks rising up at the center of these large dead acres. The three concrete fields taking up 2, uh, 22,000 square meters may be seen as a huge gravestone covering the arses of 800,000 Jews and 20,000 Roma and Sinti murdered in the gas chambers of Treblinka. This immense mass of stones arouses a strong feeling of brokenness and discontinuity, contrary to the traditional the commemoration culture. Discontinuity and discourse that became only common later from the 1970s on. This last remark brings me right to the question what these examples from France and Poland point, at, point to. First of all, these non-conformist films, novels and monuments illustrate how under the mainstream public memory culture in the West as well as the East, other ideas did develop. And secondly, this, the dissent ideas and perspective appear to set the tune for the evolution of commemorative discourse from the 1960s on. In this process, a different set of ideas and commemorative practices developed, rooting in a discourse that appeared to be more universal, raising new moral and philosophical issues, and opening up for other aspects of the past, human loss, suffering, the traumas of individuals and specific groups, and at the same time developing a new grammar of commemoration, a monumental language, aesthetic, a new aesthetic language in films, poetry, novels. And this brings us to part two, which I will discuss less extensively on the patterns in memory culture that developed from the late 1960s on. The first, such, the first signs of this change in dominant patterns in the prevailing commemorative culture were closely connected to the cultural and political revolution of the 60s, to start with Western Europe. In several countries, the traditional view of the war became a source for political and moral criticism to fight the conservative morals of the bourgeois establishment in Paris, the Netherlands, and Germany. Traditional forms of authoritarian rule, colonialism, neo-colonialism, conformism, the war in Vietnam, all this, this political upheaval of the 1960s, in these disputes, in these political disputes, the war became a source for arguments. Because in the eyes of the critics, uh, it was the same, it was the same social and political system that produced fascism, or at least didn't oppose it as it should have been done. As it should have been done. The Eichmann trial from the early 60s offered the final argument. He was the perfect bureaucrat, turning into a mass killer, a Schreibtisch murder. Traditional ideology, nationalism, and religion were considered to be responsible for the past. They lost their position, British criticism, and so did the commemoration culture that had been founded at these ideologies. Instead of the idea of a sensible struggle for a higher national or ideological cause, new teams became dominant. The senseless sufferings, as I said, the persecution, the camps, the individual pain. The fundamental nature of the, of the metamorphosis of the historical culture may be read from its many new forms of expressions. The hundreds of monuments erected throughout Europe since 1970, not only in commemoration of the murdered Jews, but also of other persecuted groups, such as Roma and Sinti, homosexuals, and all other kinds of things. A beautiful example of such a monument is the Jewish monument in the city, ah, sorry, 
is the, is the Jewish monument in the city of Pony, in the north of the Netherlands, erected as early as 1967 after a local initiative and paid by the city's population. Deeply ashamed now, 20 years after the war, deeply ashamed after discovering the darkest episodes of the history of the city's history, the deportation and killing of 5,000 Jewish compatriots. From 1970 on, the places where the persecution and killing occurred were cultivated and visited by a growing number of people. Even more influential was probably the explosion of movies, docu docu documentaries and television programs with the worldwide broadcasting of the series Holocaust in 1978 as a milestone. The impact of this series, particularly in Western Europe, but also in other parts of the world, to start with the US, may be read from the fact that the term Holocaust didn't exist before 1977 outside the US. Nobody knew if you would ask somebody, would have asked somebody in 1960, what's the Holocaust, would have had no idea. So the, the, the impact of the film may be read from the, from the introduction of the term. And the, nowadays the term is used everywhere. This very fact also points to another phenomenon, the growing convergence of commemorative cultures in Europe, at least initially in Western Europe and the US. In the Netherlands, for example, the, the developments went very, oh, sorry, however, there have been major differences with respect to the pace and the ways traditional representations of the past were overthrown. In the Netherlands, for example, the developments went very fast, fastly, at a much higher pace than, for example, France, with its strong centralist state tradition. In France, the Vichy past was to be addressed by some foreign historians before it reached a wider audience. Thanks to a lengthy television documentary, Le Chagrin et le Pétier, produced in 1974 by the French television in the collaboration with the German and the Swiss television station. This documentary, which was mainly about Vichy, blew away the Gaulish myth of a national and unified resistance, exposing a widely spread anti-Semitism and sympathy for fascism and Nazism among French citizens during the war many of whom took advantage of the situation and collaborated. The government, the French government in the 70s, initially prohibited broadcasting. It had to be shown in cinemas. Nevertheless, Le Chagrin et La Pitié gave rise to vehement debates, breaking the silence about the persecution of the Jews and the French collaboration. A process that was only finalized last month Last month, last month, by the new French president François Hollande, who publicly, for the first time, and officially acknowledged the war, the war guilt of the divided French state. It was the first time 60 years after the end of the war. 70 years. In Eastern Europe, the first sign of a new historical culture became visible already before the downfall of communism. In Eastern Europe, the first signs of a new historical culture became visible already before the downfall of communism. This was particularly the case in Poland, and may be related to a gradual but fundamental change of opinion in circles of the Polish opposition around 1980. Progressive intellectuals outside and within the Catholic Church formed an alliance based on what its intellectual leader, secular leader, Adam Michnik, Michnik called an intensified feeling of responsibility for human dignity and the pursuit to recover the truth. These ideas underlined solidarity, so solidarity, the mass movement that was to play such an important role in the downfall of communist rule, but also to the process of reorientation and redefining Polish national identity and consequently the image of the past. For, for stressing the importance of human dignity and truth telling, cleared away 
for a reassessment of the place of the Jews in Polish history, both by Catholic and nationalist. This led to, a, to another culture of remembrance, as became particularly clear in 1979 when Karol Wojtyla, who, as the Archbishop of Krakow, had already played an important role in the reorientation of the Catholic Church, visited Auschwitz in his capacity as newly chosen head of the Roman Catholic Church. Simultaneously with the explicit, though not fully unambiguous, recognition of the end losing, the final solution by the Catholic Church and its members, anti-Semitism in Poland itself also became a <coughs> subject of discussion for the first time, subject of the open discussion. These often heated debates gradually resulted in a new image of the past. For the first time, the Jews too belonged to this image. The acceptance of this, what I call, pluralist view of Polish history led to a revolutionary conceptual change as well. For the first time in history, one did not speak in terms of we versus they, and of Jews and Poles, but of fellow countrymen, Jewish Poles and non-Jewish Poles. Ladies and gentlemen, considering the changes in commemorative culture in various countries, the following patterns appear. The following patterns appear. National memory becomes subject of internal political disputes, as I explained for the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, Italy, France. One must incline to stress discontinuity of the past instead of continuity, like in the case of the Netherlands, where the occupation period became part of a huge line in history, of a straight line in history. So the, 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 the Nazi horrors atrocity were seen as something which was a break in history instead of continuity. And part of this, this new discourse was the central position of Auschwitz or the Holocaust. And there was a, a, a tendency to universalization. And this was also due to films, television, and the impact on, of uh, American popular culture. And as I have said already, it led to a new aesthetics of public remembrance. And this new aesthetics in the art of memory had already been shown, as I said, in the monuments and films, in some of these monuments and films in the 1950s, like Louis Brouillard from Lincoln, but from 1970 on, one may find this kind of aesthetic expressions everywhere. There is really a break in aesthetic language in monuments, starting in countries like the Netherlands and Germany, and then spreading over, uh, over the rest of Europe. I said this was the monument, the monument in Amsterdam, uh, the Auschwitz monument, 1973, made by the sculptor and writer Jan Walkers, Never again it is uh, a broken mirror which reflects a broken, uh, a broken uh, sky. The sky lost its, its innocence by what was happening under it. That's the meaning of the monument. Or this monument in, in uh, Vienna, um, the white reds Manna für die Österreichische Jüdische Opfer der Shoah in Vienna, revealed in 2000 a massive piece of stone and it's right in the middle of a very nice and friendly baroque environment. It's really an indigestible past. You can't miss it. You will, I mean, it's, it, is, it is there. Or a recent example from Poland, a monument for the Jewish ghetto in Krakow. 60 chairs in two different groups. Or, and you know this all, the Mama in Berlin, which, com which comes, and very few people realize that it comes very close to the Tablinka monument mm -hmm. in many respects, symbolizing brokenness, fastness, inconsumerability, and terror. Ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, summing up these developments and pointing to some example of the new aesthetic language. I silently included already developments in some parts of Europe that once were part of the communist East. Poland is an example. 
but so I could also call the Czech Republic countries that indeed in many respects follow, follow patterns that were typical for Western Europe before 1990 already it, and, and so they, they followed these patterns uh, from 1990 on. A central element in this process is the position of Auschwitz, symbolizing the systematic destruction of the Jews, the mentally disabled, Roma, and other groups considered to be inferior, to, uh, inferior by the Nazis. A story of destruction that is now considered to be the key experience of the Second World War as the symbol in the world of the German historian Ernst Nolte as the symbol par excellence of the negative myth of absolute evil, the negative mythos of an absolute böse. Still vital in the arts, in philosophy, in ethics and history. It would be, however, too easy to say that the East follows the West in all aspects that I've mentioned before. The answer is no, it didn't. The burden of the past in the East is not only heavier, but also endlessly more complicated. And so is public memory in Eastern Europe since 1989. The reasons for the variation in the development of memory cultures in Eastern Europe are numerous. To start with the fact that the fall down of communism co-occurred with the rebirth of various religious, nationalist, or political movements. As a consequence, representations of the past reappeared that had been expelled from public discourse for several decades. To turning up, turning open many old and painful rounds in countries such as Latvia, Slovakia, Hungary, and Ukraine. Countries where the struggle for national independence had always been fought with highly dubious means. Nevertheless, as we, as we have seen over the years, and not only in Poland, but also in the Czech Republic and the Baltic states, the rise of the true civil society generated more pluralist views of history in which the past in which the past persecution of ethnic, cultural and religious minority groups were to be taken into account. From country to country, the outcome of these processes <coughs> were very different at various moments since 1989. Just two examples besides Poland that I already mentioned. The first comes from Bulgaria, where the government tried to blow up this mausoleum of Dimitrov, the first president of Bulgaria after World War II. He was a famous communist who was accused of setting fire to the Reichstag in February 1933. And in the show process Goebbels had organized, he turned out to be a fierce opponent, amazing the world by the way he defended himself and the other communists involved. After the war, he was the leader of the new re regime that established communist rule in B Bulgaria. And in the 90s, they tried to blow it up. And they failed the first time. It was too massive. <laughs> and so they used more dy dynamite. And it failed again. And it's so heavily constructed, <coughs> they can't destroy it without harming the environment. So they left it with growing it with, uh, with, with the gardens. And the second example I would like to bring up, and with which I would like to conclude this overview, is the most recent one, and is directly related to the history of the city, St. Petersburg, or more precisely, Leningrad. I mentioned before, documentary 900 Days. Without giving any judgment, with regard to its historical accuracy or its representativity, it is clear that the documentary exactly does what writers and artists already did elsewhere. Searching behind the official stories of heroism and national unity, hitting upon the private and social memories, the stories about grief and 
trauma and suffering that were never told or were, as the films try to, uh, uh, to, to argue, were deliberately repressed. The documentary literally performs the painful contrast between the nationalist politics of memory and the often conflicting memories of a harsh and useless suffering, which is indeed a starting point for what I call a pluralist view of the past, as for example, Memorial in Russia had already been shown before. This makes it definitely an interesting object, this film, for research. But this is something, perhaps something, we might discuss later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm asking to give a short time. Uh, well, Professor Andre, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, it was a very important and interesting presentation. And uh, you can see that it would be right, the right place and uh, at the right uh, time to deliver a lecture like this here because. Well, the memory on the Second World War is extremely important for Russia. I would say it's extremely important for contemporary Russian identity. Uh, the memory of the Second World War was the reason ever of the regime. Uh, the memory on the Second World War was a part of a civic religion in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union. And my generation was raised within this religion, I say, and when I did my military service in the Soviet Army, our political officer told us, well boys, your fathers and grandfathers crushed this enemy, we must continue this in your mother, so all of us will do everything. All people in line with the regiment, the Russian, the Georgians, Ukrainians, all of us, we were united by this civic uh, religion. And it, it's, it's a huge problem uh, for us, it's, it's even for my generation. I was born in 1955. Yeah. Uh, even for us, it's, it's still a separate memory. And uh, being a historian, I 100% for deconstruction of all historical myth. However, I do understand how it's difficult for many people in my country and other countries uh, as well. Uh, I would like to say also, one thing about actors of memory, you must say about personal memory, about family memory as well. Uh, well, I was born 10 years after the war, but I've seen some victims of war who became victims just in front of my eyes. 1962, I was in one small village for the Russian hospital, and close to my bed there was a poor boy, and I'm sorry, practically nothing between his legs. It was a mine. The mines were exploded in forests of Russia and Russia decades and decades after, after the war. It's a very special memory. It's continued to kill people, literally. And, and to some extent that supported that Soviet mythology. That, that's why in, in the new political situation, uh, while some colleagues of mine uh, demand the total deconstruction of Soviet myth of great patriotic war, because from their point of view, uh, that's um, a kind of implicit support of Stalinism. And I'm very, very, very careful about it. I think it could work, it could get an opposite result. I mean, you know, there's this uh, attack of, on this view. So, uh, thinking about our contemporary politics of memory, thinking about how new generations of the Russians must remember Second World War, we must uh, think a lot about the experience of other countries you've mentioned in, 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 in your talk. Uh, so, it's more <coughs> um, uh, the case of Poland, case of France, case of Netherlands, you've mentioned, or, 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 or also Germany, Germany, and, and that's, that, that's important. 
we, we could mention also some countries uh, where politics of memory uh, was vital for countries like Israel or previous Yugoslavia or some uh, other countries where it still works and it's it's very political memory and very party memory in, in, in a sense uh, right now. Uh, I'm not a specialist in this field. I don't know much about memory on Second World War. However, uh, I do uh, start class devoted to memory studies. Things like this. Just today, there are some students of mine in, in this room. We discuss memory on civil wars in different, different countries. And we discuss usually in this uh, class the famous book of Andrei Rousseau, Saint Vichy's and and you've mentioned. Uh, so, I would rise, like to raise uh, some questions, maybe to you, and maybe questions for discussions uh, in this audience. Uh, so, while speaking about uh, actors, we speak mostly uh, about uh, political actors, the state, the hard power, uh, I would say, as a main actor. But uh, to what extent uh, to what extent uh, personal memory, memory influences these big discourse and uh, experiences influences of these discourse. It, it changes memory. People remember personally it in a very different different way, uh, and uh, big discourse is reflected here. Um, how past is used with, by different political elite? Uh, it looks like at the Soviet time it was one single united memory on the Second World War. But I don't think it's the case. Even within the communist elite there were different national projects, uh, different legitimizing uh, projects. So there were some hidden conflicts behind this united uh, policy of, of, of memory. Uh, I have ma many uh, questions and uh, one question which, which is uh, well, the, the issue of censorship of course is central, or central for it and you've mentioned this um, Night and Frog movie and uh, we, we can remember that this French movie was self-censored or censored by the author they did want to show even in the year 1956 uh, I suppose uh, that it was the French who did some deportation so they just overshadow some part uh, of, of, of the screen uh, to not to show the French policemen so the audience perceived that it was uh, the, the, the German case and uh, while speaking about uh, using of the past right now or one uh, also dangerous question is the market the market as an actor of this memory and in the in, 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 uh, I, I wouldn't just, don't want just to say that it's a bad impact, right? but definitely it's, it's a, a very ambivalent. How memory of the Second World War is sold literally to the public? How, how, how terror is sold? That's a problem. How Holocaust is, is sold? Yeah, that, that's a big problem. And uh, one thing. Um, I, uh, I, I just want to, to add, uh, it's a tragic memory and still now it is remembered in a very different way in a different country. And it couldn't be other way. So Holocaust is remembered in a different way in other countries and I think it, it's inevitable. And I think it would be uh, dangerous to say it is a good and right, correct pattern of memory here, and that is uh, around there. Thank you so much for the presentation.